Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we can come to it and that you speak to us through it. We thank you that it is alive and active. And Lord, that you guide us, that you equip us and that you train us through it. So I pray this morning that you would move in our hearts, move in our minds as we look at this. Amen. Have, um, are, are any of you guys Star Trek fans? Do we have any Star Trek fans this morning? We've got a few. We've got a few over here. Um, who likes Star Trek more than Star Wars? Ooh. <laughs> uh, I can't decide. I can never decide. But I love Star Trek so much, especially like the new, the new films. And um, I was really excited when the, the new film came out not too long ago, Star Trek Beyond. Have any of you guys seen, been to see that one, the new ones? Yeah, nice. Timon's got my back. He knows it. Um, and I was really excited to see it. And so we, we booked some tickets on the cheap Tuesday, of course, and we were all excited, ready to go. And Claudia has netball training on, on Tuesdays. And it was okay because she finished half an hour before the, the movie started, so there was time for her to drive back and pick us up and go to the movies. But of course, at, the, at netball practice, she's with the girls. They start chatting away, talking about the week, what's going on. And all of a sudden, Claudia is home five minutes before the movie starts. Uh, so we rush, get ready, jump in the car, drive down, and we, we arrive 10 minutes late to the movie. And so we get in there and we've missed the first kind of scene in the movie that kind of like sets things up. And all of a sudden there are some characters there that I don't really know who they are and where they've come from and what purpose they have. Um, and it kind of takes you a while to orientate, reorientate yourself in the movie. Um, have any of you guys ever come late to a movie or kind of started a movie halfway through? <laughs> um, and it's kind of a bit like that with the, the Old and New Testaments. When sometimes we can kind of look at the Old Testament like, man, there's some pretty boring stuff in there. There's like huge family lists. There's like intricate details about how to build a temple and rituals and sacrifices and all this other kind of stuff. And we can kind of think, I'm just going to skip that and go to the New Testament, the good stuff. Jesus is in the New Testament. We'll go there. Um, but within that, you miss the first half of the story. When you miss the Old Testament, you miss out on so much of the richness of the character development, the themes, all of these things that really bring meaning to the New Testament, to all that Jesus has done. And so this morning, the passages we're kind of looking at can seem a bit dry. And the passages we're looking at are actually to do with the, the priests in the Old Testament. So we're looking at chapters 28, 29, and 30 of Exodus, if you want to have a look, if you want to follow along. Um, and there are some quite specific things that these priests are required to do. And these priests, they had a really important role in the, um, the lifestyle, the culture of Israel at the time. They would go into the temple to where God himself dwelt and bring the prayers and petitions of the people before God. So before his amazing holiness. And they would have to um, do all of these things. They would have to um, clean themselves, they would have to offer sacrifices, they would have to wear specific things. Um, and so we're going to have a look at these passages and, and see what exactly they're meaning and how that fits in with the, the greater story of the Bible. So just to kind of give you a bit of an idea um, about why they had to do all of these really strict rituals, um, I've got a video up here that is going to have a talk about the, um, the holiness of God and what it was actually like to go into his, his presence and why these people needed to um, present themselves in an appropriate way. And it's quite clear in here that if they didn't do these specific things, they would die. So it's a fairly serious thing um, that, they were, that they were doing. So let's have a watch um, to set us up for this morning. You've probably heard the word holy before, or at least sang it in a church song once or twice. And for most people, this idea is really just connected to being a morally good person. So God is holy because he's morally perfect. Yeah, that is part of it. But in the Bible, the idea of holiness is even bigger and more rich. What it's really describing is how God is the creative force behind the whole universe. He's the one and only being with the power to make a world full of such beauty and life. And so all these abilities, they make God utterly unique, which is the meaning of the word holy. 
So a helpful way to think about God's holiness is by using the sun as a metaphor. The sun is unique, at least within our solar system, and it's really powerful. It's the source of all this beautiful life on our planet. And so you could say that the sun is holy. And you can actually take this metaphor even further in that the whole area around the sun is also holy. Yeah, because the closer you get to the sun, the more intense it gets. Yeah, exactly. So that very power and goodness that generates all this life is also dangerous. I mean, the sun, if you get too close, will annihilate you. And in the same way, there's this paradox at the heart of God's own holiness, because if you're impure, his presence is dangerous to you. And not because it's bad, but because it's so good. And so the first time we see this paradox of God's holiness, it's in the story of Moses and the burning bush. So God tells Moses to take off his sandals because he's standing on holy ground. And Moses covers his face in fear, and God says, hey, don't come any closer. It's intense. It's actually that intensity of God's holiness that's explored even more in the stories about Israel's temple, which was the main place where God's holy presence was located. And at the center of the temple was this room called the most holy place, this the hot spot of God's presence. And whether you're an Israelite living in the land around the temple or a priest working right in the temple, you're in proximity to God's holy presence, which is dangerous. Yeah, this is a problem. So how's it supposed to work? Well, in the Bible, the solution is that you need to become pure. So like being morally pure. Yeah, and that's easy enough to understand. But the Bible spends a lot of time talking about another kind of purity, being ritually pure, which is a state where you separate yourself from anything related to death, like touching things like diseased skin or dead bodies or even certain bodily fluids. All these make you impure. And becoming ritually impure isn't necessarily sinful. What's wrong is waltzing into God's presence when you're in an impure state. And so that's why God gave the Israelites very clear instructions for knowing when they were impure, steps to become pure, so that they could go into the temple again. So I I hope that gives a bit of an understanding about the the holiness of God and why they needed to, to do these things to be able to enter in. And so in these chapters, it talks about how these priests, before they entered into the Holy of Holies, they would need to be equipped with certain things, they would need to be worthy, and they would need to be clean. And the first of which is equipped. So to enter into God's presence, they needed to wear specific things. Um, And so we're going to have a read about what exactly they needed to wear in chapter 28 of Exodus, if you want to follow along, starting in in verse 3. Says this, tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priest. These are the garments they are to make a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons so that they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. So here's a um, picture of what it actually looked like or what they think kind of looked like. And there's kind of all sorts of stuff in there that words we don't really use anymore. Um, but you've got the turban, the diadem, the tunic, breastplate, ephod, robe. This is kind of what they used to wear. I actually think Nathaniel would actually look really good in this. So <laughs> next week, I'll have you a coffee. <laughs> but it was, a, it was quite a big part. And each of, each of the elements in this, in this outfit, they, they represent something quite significant. I mean, I won't go into the details of what it represented, but this outfit um, that they were equipped with was an outward sign of an inward reality. It was meant to show that the priests had the right heart, that their heart was in the right place with God and with the Israelites they were serving. And right after this description of the priests' equipment, there's a passage that describes the the process that each priest needed to go through to become worthy um, to enter into God's presence. Because each of the priests were human, like like you and me. They made mistakes. They messed up from time to time. They weren't perfect people, um, which which is sin, brokenness. They were broken people. And they needed to deal with that brokenness before they were able to be counted as worthy of going into God's presence. So they, they needed to deal with it. And what they would do is they would, um, they would get a, a bull and sacrifice it. So let's have a read in verse 10 of chapter 29. 
Bring the bull to the front of the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on its head, slaughter it in the name in the Lord's presence at the entrance to the tent of meeting. I mean, it kind of all sounds a bit weird and gross that they would sacrifice this this bull, but essentially the bull sacrifice absorbed the sin or brokenness of the priests and made them worthy of entering into the temple. And just a quick word of warning, if any of you are thinking of going out and sacrificing a bull so you can be in God's presence, you don't need to. Jesus has sorted that out, but we'll, um, we'll come back to that soon. And the final thing we, we read about that the priests need to do is that they need to be bodily and spiritually clean. It says this in verse 17 of Exodus 30. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with his bronze stand for washing, place it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that, so that they will not die. And this process is really important because nothing unclean or impure can come before God. Remember what we were watching in the video before. And the verse, the, it's pretty, clean, pretty clear here that if they didn't do these really specific things, that they would die. So these are the three requirements that the, that the priests had before entering into the temple, before worshipping before God, before bringing the prayers of the people before him. But in all of this Old Testament detail, it's, it's quite important to, to keep in mind the wider story of the Bible. Each of these things that the priests had to do foreshadowed Jesus and showed how he would become the perfect eternal high priest. All of this is backstory to the movie. All of this gives meaning to what's going to happen later on in the story when Jesus comes. So sometimes we can kind of think that Jesus came to, to do away with all of this Old Testament stuff, the funny rituals, the gross animal sacrifices, but he says in chapter 5 of, of Matthew that he didn't come to abolish it, he came to fulfill it. And that what he does, um, to help, and to help us understand this a bit, we've got a second half of the video that will explain a little bit more about the impact Jesus has on these rituals and sacrifices. Wow. Right. But it doesn't stop there. This idea keeps developing. So later in the scriptures, we find this really interesting story by a prophet named Isaiah. And he has this crazy vision where he's in the temple and he's right in God's presence. He's totally terrified. Yeah, he knows the rules. He shouldn't even be in there. And he's worried about being destroyed. And then this crazy creature called a seraphim. Yeah, that is a crazy creature. <laughs> totally. So it flies over with a hot coal and then it sears Isaiah's lips with the coal and says something really weird. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. So this burning coal somehow makes Isaiah pure. Yeah, it's remarkable because normally if you touch something impure, it transfers its impurity to you. But now here's this new idea where you have this coal, this very holy and pure object, and it touches Isaiah and it transfers its purity to him. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by it. I mean, the implications of this are just huge. But there's one more development, this time from another prophet, Ezekiel. And he has this vision where he's standing at the temple and he sees water trickling out from it. And then that water turns into a stream and then it grows into a deep river that starts flowing through the desert, leaving this trail of green trees behind it. And then it flows into the Dead Sea, making everything fresh and alive. So instead of becoming pure first and then going into the temple, here God's holiness comes out from the temple, making things pure and bringing them to life. What does it all mean? So we don't know until we meet this man, Jesus. And he claims that he's fulfilling all of these ancient visions, but in surprising new ways. So Jesus, he went around touching people who are impure, people with skin diseases, a, a woman with chronic bleeding or dead people. And when he touches them, their impurity should transfer over to Jesus, 
but instead Jesus' purity transfers to them and actually heals their bodies. Jesus is like that holy coal in Isaiah's vision. Right. And Jesus claimed that he was the human embodiment of God's own holiness and that he and his followers were now God's temple so that through them, God's holy presence would go out into the world and bring life and healing and hope. And so this is why Jesus described his followers as having streams of living water flowing out of them. So this is our part of the story where we find ourselves now. But Where's this all heading? So the last pages of the Bible end with a final vision about God's holiness. This time it's by a guy named John. And in his vision, we see the whole world made completely new. The entire earth has become God's temple. And Ezekiel's river is there, flowing out of God's presence, immersing all of creation, removing all impurity, and bringing everything back to life. So you can start to see that Jesus uh, isn't abolishing these um, these rituals or what the Old Testament was, he's starting to fulfill them, starting to reverse them, um, which I find fascinating. And Jesus is, is many things, but among them is that he is our high priest. He stands between us and God. When we pray, Jesus takes our prayers through the Holy Spirit, makes them perfect and holy and presents them to God the Father. This is why we pray in the name of Jesus, because it's only through Jesus that we pray. And I love how the book of, of Hebrews puts it in the, in the New Testament in chapter 7. It says, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he, is, he always lives to intercede for them. And I love this because Jesus is the, is the perfect priest or go-between. Because firstly, he's eternal. He's not going to live for 80 years and then die like the other priests before him. So he's able to completely save and renew those who come to him. And I love it. In Scripture, it also talks about how the, the names of, um, of the people who follow him are engraved on the palm of his hand. Um, and so that's how close we are. That's how real we are in front of him. And I love how it says in this passage that he lives to intercede for us. It's Jesus' joy for each of us um, to know him, for him to transform our hearts and to make our prayers and to take our prayers and concerns to God the Father. And not only this, because because Jesus lived the, the perfect life without sin and completely in God's will, he doesn't need to wash himself or offer sacrifices to an animal, or wear special clothing before worshipping before God, or before bringing our prayers to him. And remember how in the video, how the, how the priest touched, when, a, when the priest touched something impure, the impurity transferred over to them. Well, Jesus reverses this, because he is so wholly impure, that when he touches something unclean, it makes it clean. So when we come to meet Jesus, he purifies us. He forgives us the wrong that we have done towards God and towards others. And he also purifies us from the wrongs that have been committed against us. And remember, this is an ongoing process as well. And this is really important because so often we feel like we can't pray to God. Or we can't come to church because we don't feel worthy of being a Christian because of the wrongs we've committed. We say things like, man... I could never go into church. That's not a place where I go. That's not a place for people like me. Or, man, God would never love me. I'm broken, I'm worthless. I can't live up to those goody-good Christians that kind of go to church on Sundays. But without Jesus, none of us could meet with God. But he purifies us, he forgives us, forgives each of us so that we can be renewed, restored so that we may meet with God. And this isn't just a one-time thing. This is an ongoing process that Jesus is continually purifying us from the day we choose to follow him to the day we meet him face to face in heaven. So now we can worship God without fear of our past wrongs coming between us. And this doesn't mean that God doesn't care about our actions. He actually cares very deeply about them. But what it does mean is that Jesus has paid the price. He has made the way. 
And when Jesus transfers his holiness over to us, um, he also makes us worthy. We don't need to offer sacrifices because he made the one perfect sacrifice when he died on the cross. He paid the price to count us as worthy to enter into God's presence. And I don't know about you, but I quite often end up comparing myself to others. It's like a big thing on like social media when you see people over in like France or, or wherever, you kind of, man, I wish I was over there. Or you see them doing amazing work and you think, man, I wish I was in Africa serving. That's really where um, the action's at. Man, I've got nothing to offer. But it's not what we have that, that matters. We could have a few talents or a multitude. What matters is that Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we could be made worthy of knowing God. And that because we are made worthy when we come to God, with whatever we have, rich or poor, whoever we are, European, Maori, New Zealander, and God will count each of us worthy. And each of you are worthy when you know Jesus. And because we're clean and we're worthy, God is so pleased to equip us for the calling or purpose that he has for each of us. So we don't need to wear these funny clothes if we want to serve God. And I love that God equips those he calls, and he chooses the most unlikely people. When you read through the New Testament, Jesus picks the most motley crew of guys possible um, to change the world. He picks a bunch of fishermen, he picks a tax collector, a few other guys. He takes them and he equips them. He journeys with them. So if you think you have, if you don't have enough skills or talent or brains to serve and worship God, just take a look at what Jesus had to work with. I'm always um, quite encouraged by this story as well because when I um, when I went through university, I trained to um, to work in commerce. I was planning on climbing corporate ladders and making lots of money, but then God came along and kind of reorientated me a little bit and ended up calling me into to youth ministry. I felt God really strongly placing me in that opening doors, even though I had no training in that area. And it was kind of a bit confusing at the time. I was like, God, you want me to work with young people? I've never worked with young people. I didn't even go to youth group as a teenager. And yet God journeyed with me in that and equipped me as I went along. It wasn't as if he just kind of plonked down all the skills that I needed to be able to disciple young people, but it was a process of equipping. And quite often God does equip us for, for unexpected work. And I think that's quite exciting and scary at the same time. He equips the old to serve the young, the young to serve the old. He mixes things up, it's quite unexpected. And so if you feel as though God is calling you to something that you are unsure of, or haven't got experience in, then I would encourage you to pursue that. Because if it is in God's calling, then he will equip you. Maybe not necessarily right away, but, it will, but he will equip you over time. And know that in a church, quite often we can get tied up in working for our salvation, that we need to do more if we're to please God. But we need to know that Jesus has done the work. That he's paid the price, he's made us clean, He's made us worthy. It's all because of him. It's nothing because of we do. We, serve, we should be serving out of the joy of that reality, not compulsion. And in the end, I guess it all comes back to, to Jesus. Our great high priest who intercedes for us, he connects us with God the Father, takes our prayers and offers them to him. Because of Jesus, we can pray anywhere at any time and know that we will be heard. Because of Jesus, we're cleaned and made holy. Our sins forgiven, our dirt washed away. Because of Jesus, we can be counted worthy of knowing God. Counted worthy of the calling that he has for each of us. And because of Jesus, we can be equipped to worship and serve God. Whatever calling or purpose he has for us. Because Jesus takes all who come to him. He doesn't turn anyone away. He takes us and transforms us. Our hearts makes us worthy and allows us to experience the joy of being fully able to worship the God who knows and loves us. He gives us the ability to be fully alive. Let's pray.
Jesus, we thank you that you made a way. That through your living, dying and rising again, you made a way for us to connect back with our Father in heaven. And Lord, we thank you that you are at work amongst your people, that you intercede for us, that you go between, that you take our prayers to the Father, perfect and holy. Lord, we thank you that you equip us for the work you have called us to, whatever that may be or however unlikely that may seem. Lord, we thank you that because of your sacrifice, you have made us worthy of knowing God. And Lord, we thank you that you have purified us, that you have made us clean, that you have forgiven us our sins, our brokenness. We thank you that you have made us whole. Amen.